This is NASA TV. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'm Dan Hewitt. We are here today to talk about the upcoming Crew-4 mission, four astronauts ready to launch on the fourth rotational mission flown by SpaceX as part of NASA's commercial crew program. Uh, we're going to hear from a couple of different uh, folks off the top. They're going to give opening remarks, and then, as usual, we'll go through a question and answer session with everybody here in the room and those of you on the phone bridge. I'm going to start off by introducing our participants, and then I'll hand it over for opening remarks. So joining us today remotely, first off, we have Kathy Leaders, NASA's Associate Administrator for the Space Operations Mission Directorate. Here in the room with me, I have Steve Stitch, the manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program, and Dana Weigel, the Deputy Manager of NASA's International Space Station Program. Joining us remotely from SpaceX, we have Jessica Jensen, the Vice President of Customer Operations and Integration at SpaceX. And then finally, over from Europe, we have Frank DeWinna, the Program Manager for ESA's International Space Station Program. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy to lead us off with opening remarks. Kathy? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I think you're going to get sick of us seeing us over the next few weeks as we're heading through our continuing to head through our mission campaign. It is such an exciting time for us here at NASA, like we talked about last week. Um, we safely brought Mark Vandehei home. Thank you to our Roscosmos uh, partners who delivered Mark Vandehei, and, our, and our, our team has delivered him back home, and we're so happy that he's able to be back in Houston with his NASA family and his family. Um, and then we're here we are getting ready for our crew rotation missions. Um, once again, launching our crews to the International Space Station and returning our crews. And then we have our Boeing uncrewed demonstration and then leading up to the Artemis I uncrewed demonstration. What is very, very clear though, amongst all of us, is that as we're heading through all these missions, these crewed missions, require a vigilance of the team and constant careful preparations as we continue to head into these critical parts of the mission. So just like the ISS and Roscosmos team carefully prepared for Mark's return, and we are now getting ready to fly another set of four crew to the International Space Station and getting prepared for returning a set of four crew from the International Space Station. I know the teams will be telling you about how they are carefully getting ready for the steps, and we're looking forward to all the missions going on over this next few months. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kathy. Next up, Steve Stitch, manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Steve? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. It is uh, great to be here. It's an exciting spring, as, as Kathy talked about. Um, and it feels good to be back in the swing of uh, launching and preparing for our crew rotation flight. Um, this is the fourth crew rotation mission. It's kind of almost surreal that we're here on this fourth mission, uh, launching four crew in the fourth month of the year on our fourth flight booster. So it's kind of a 444 mission for us. Uh, it's a huge accomplishment for our team and the industry. You know, we've been closely working with Dana and the ISS program on the Axiom mission, and I'll talk a little bit more about those dependencies, but because of the complexity of the Axiom mission and where we're at with the crew for preparations, as Kathy said, uh, we are going to adjust the launch date uh, a little bit for crew four. Uh, we are doing that today at the program control board. We'll uh, move that mission to uh, no earlier than April the 20th with a launch time of 6.37 a.m. Eastern time. We would dock. Um, the docking time may be adjusted a little bit on April 21st, uh, probably around 6 a.m. Eastern or so, and we'll work that with the ISS team. And that really is just to give us a little more spacing between the two flights uh, and make sure that we have everything ready to go for the Crew-4 mission. Uh, of course, Jessica will talk more about the hardware, but uh, all the hardware for the mission is, is at the Cape and, and being prepared for launch for Crew-4. We'll have a, a brand new Dragon uh, spacecraft, Freedom, for this flight. 
Um, it just shipped from Hawthorne, you know, a number of weeks ago, and it's going through processing at KSC. Uh, the SpaceX team has done a great job working both uh, the Crew-4 mission and the, uh, the Axiom mission as well. Um, you know, we are continuing to embark upon uh, reuse for the crewed missions, and in particular, this flight has a couple of items that are first time. Uh, the heat shield composite structure uh, on Dragon will be reused for um, uh, for the first time in the commercial crew program. We've been doing that on the CRS flights with Dana for a while, the cargo flights, and then we'll have reuse of four service section Draco thrusters as well. Um, of course, uh, as I talked about uh, for the booster, it's the fourth flight of this booster. This is the same booster we flew uh, for the Crew-3 flight, um, and uh, it flew one other flight in between those. We've, we've done all the analysis for the booster, and we're closing that work out, and we feel very good about the fourth flight booster. Um, we are, uh, it's very important, as Kathy talked about, Mark Van Hei returned uh, successfully uh, yesterday, and so for this flight, we are going to embark upon a direct handover. It's important for us to launch Crew-4 first, and then hand of a handover of approximately of five days or so, and then return the Crew-3 mission. So we're setting up for that. Um, I did talk to the Crew-3 astronauts this morning along with Dana Weigel. Uh, they're doing well. Their spacecraft endurance is doing well. They are excited about the upcoming Axiom mission. They're excited about Crew-4, and, and they told us uh, they're having a lot of fun on station, and they're wait, re willing to stay and do whatever we need. So, so they're doing well. The spacecraft is healthy. Um, Probably one change, we're likely not to do a fly around on, on uh, Crew 3 return. We got uh, some good data from Crew 2, and we really don't need the fly around for Crew 3. The imagery is, is not quite as uh, helpful as ISS once thought. So, so when we go on dock, um, right now we're not planning a fly around for Crew 3. And I think that's all I had, Dan. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Steve. Next up, Dana Weigel, Deputy Program Manager for NASA's International Space Station Program. Dana? Thank you, Dan. Let's see, continuing the safe launch and return of our crew and cargo vehicles is our highest priority on station. That's really what enables us to do all the amazing things that we do on board. Um, as you've gleaned already, we are in the midst of an extremely busy spring. Over the last few weeks, we had two spacewalks and we welcomed on board a new Soyuz crew. Um, and as you've heard mentioned, Mark Van de Hei, uh, returned yesterday on the Soyuz with uh, cosmonaut crewmates Piotr and, and Anton. Uh, Mark set a new record for the longest single spaceflight mission by an American with 350 days, 355 days on orbit, which is pretty impressive. Um, the Soyuz undock itself and all the ground recovery operations were, were very smooth. They all went kind of according to our nominal plan. And then the plane bringing Mark home just landed this morning at Ellington Field. So we're really excited to have him back home with us. Uh, right around the corner, looking forward to the Axiom-1 mission. That's our first private astronaut mission to space station. That's a major milestone for us uh, in continuing to expand commercial opportunities for use of low Earth orbit. So we're really looking forward to that. And as Steve said, the crew on board is ready to go. They're ready to welcome uh, new visitors. And then right after that, we'll have the Crew-4 launch. Uh, we are targeting the five-day handover, as Steve mentioned. Uh, during that time period, during the handover, we'll have 11 crew members on board. We'll have six Americans, three Russians, a German, and an Italian. So that'll be a neat time frame for us. And then right after that, we'll bring Crew 3 home. And then in May, as Kathy mentioned, we have the Boeing OFT-2 mission, followed by SpaceX-25 cargo mission in early June. So a lot of dynamic activity. Uh, going on for us on board the uh, the vehicle. Crew 4 will bring up Chell and Samantha. They've both been to station before. They each did an expedition. Uh, so we look forward to having their experience on board. And of course, we look forward to uh, newcomers, Bob and Jessica, joining us. They'll be up there with us until the fall time frame. A lot of research is planned. Um, we've got some material science, some uh, plant-related science, and also some health technologies. That's going to further some of the uh, capabilities that we need for going beyond low Earth orbit. It also brings a lot of benefits uh, to us here on Earth. Um, so I think Station is ready to uh, welcome Crew 4. And with that, Dan, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, Dana. Now we're going to head out to California. Jessica Jensen, the Vice President of Customer Operations and Integration at SpaceX. Jessica. Good morning. 
<clears throat> so I just want to say it's an honor to be here today um, with my NASA and ESA colleagues as we prepare for the next NASA crew mission to the International Space Station. Um, like everyone's mentioned, it's a, an exciting and busy time. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few things. Yeah, we talked about SLS and Orion are on the launch pad for in preparation for the Artemis 1 mission. And then we will be launching, SpaceX is going to be launching the Axiom 1 crew to the space station next week. They will stay on station for about a week, return home, and then shortly after that, the Crew 4 mission will launch. And I just wanted to highlight a few fun facts here that the Crew 4 launch is going to be SpaceX's seventh human spaceflight mission overall. And it's pretty wild since it just feels like yesterday that we flew Bob and Doug on the Demo 2 mission. That was actually only in May of 2020. So this is going to be, Crew-4 will be our seventh human spaceflight mission in just under two years. And I think if I did my math right, this is also going to be our 31st Dragon mission to the International Space Station. Um, we had cargo for a very long time, and then it's been a rotation of cargo and crew since then. Um, so yeah, it's a super busy time, really exciting. Um, and, and as Kathy mentioned, we, you know, even though it looks busy and kind of crazy, astronaut safety and mission safety is always our top priority. If we have to look at something closer and take the time to do that, we will. Um, so we, we have, we are appropriately staffed to handle all of these missions. Um, and yeah, it's the safety is number one. So let me give you an update on where the status of the vehicles. So like uh, Steve mentioned, we have a new Dragon vehicle that we're adding to the fleet. And then the Falcon 9 booster previously actually supported two missions to the International Space Station, uh, CRS-22 and Crew-3. And it also launched our Turksat 5B satellite. So right now, um, basically what the Crew-4 Dragon vehicle is over in the Dragonland facility at Cape Canaveral. It is getting ready to have the capsule stacked onto the trunk. After that, the Dragon vehicle will be loaded with propellants, and then it will go through its final checkouts and closeouts. In parallel to that, Falcon 9 is also going through its final processing. Um, once those both come together, then we basically rotate Dragon over, we made it to the launch vehicle, and then we roll out for the dry dress rehearsal as well as static fire. Um, after that is completed, we do our final readiness review. It's called the launch readiness review. And that's basically where we ensure that the SpaceX teams, the NASA teams, the crew and the ISS and the FAA are all ready to launch and that we're good to proceed. So that'll all be coming up and that will take us to the launch date of April 20th. And then, yeah, I think it's been previously mentioned, there'll be a short handover with crew three, then we'll bring the crew three astronauts home. Um, in late April. So as always, yeah, I just want to thank NASA and ESA and thank you for your trust in us, for letting us work with and train your astronauts. Um, it's really been an honor for our team um, to work with Chell and Bob and Jessica and Samantha. And so we're really looking forward to this mission. Thanks, and back to you, Dan. All right, thank you, Jessica. And now we're going to go over to Frank DeWinna, the manager of the International Space Station program for ESA. Frank, take it away. And Frank, if you can hear me, you're muted. <laughs> the classical mistake. Good uh, morning, everybody in uh, Houston or in America. Good afternoon, if there are any listeners here in Europe. It's a pleasure, of course, to be here. Uh, to be again uh, looking forward to the launch of a European astronaut on board of uh, a SpaceX vehicle together with our partners from NASA, but also from uh, SpaceX. So thank you for doing all that work for us. Uh, for us, it's a, it's a great moment, of course, uh, to look forward to. It's now the third mission in a row. It's a unique experience for, for ESA that uh, for one and a half years, we will have uh, ESA astronauts on board of the International Space Station. Uh, we had Thomas Peske in the Alpha mission. Uh, we have uh, Matthias Maurer from Germany in the Cosmic Kiss mission, and uh, we now will have Samantha Christoforetti in the Minerva mission uh, going up. Uh, Samantha is her second uh, long duration space flight. So we're really looking forward uh, to that. Uh, as uh, the one female astronaut uh, today in the European Astronaut Corps, of course, she is a role model for us. She's a role model for uh, Europe. And she has really played a great role in the, the new astronaut selection that we are doing. 
Uh, we had uh, about uh, 23,000 candidates, uh, and we are currently trying to narrow this down to the, the four to six that will eventually be selected. Uh, but the great success already was that uh, more than a quarter of the candidates today uh, were uh, female uh, candidates. That was uh, a great improvement from the last uh, selection, and Samantha certainly played a big role uh, in that. Uh, for the rest, of course, we are looking forward to all the science activities that will be done on, on orbit. Uh, just to name a few, uh, we are looking into biological research with uh, Astrospira, basically trying to see if photobioreactors can be used in life support systems of the future if we go forward to the moon or uh, even further uh, to mars we have a lot of experiments on uh, fluid dynamics in our uh, fluids uh, science facility uh, looking into compositions of foam for example foam that can be very important in lightweight structures for future aerospace uh, design uh, but also foam that is uh, instrumental in uh, making all the isolation material uh, that we need uh, the, tomorrow to fight uh, climate change uh, here on Earth. So very uh, important experiments for us. And uh, also we are doing, as usually, uh, uh, research on the human body, uh, physiological research, uh, myotones, for example, looking at the muscle tones and skin tones of, of astronauts, exactly uh, to see as well if they go into longer duration space flights in the future uh, to the Moon and to Mars. Uh, how this will influence their their well-being in the spacecraft. So overall, uh, we're looking forward to uh, to a great mission. Uh, it's uh, it's exciting times as well for for Europe. We are preparing for our ministerial conference at the end of the year, where we will ask the the budget and the funding for the next uh, three years. Uh, we're looking forward to ISS extension. Uh, and our Terra Novae program, which is now our exploration program, uh, is called, is growing. Looking forward to flying astronauts to the gateway, but also further than the gateway, uh, Europe is also looking forward to having its own European astronauts one day on the surface of the moon. So, uh, all in all, very exciting times. And these missions, these back-to-back -back missions of our biggest member states, uh, France, Germany, and Italy, of course, play a major role in into this. So thanks a lot uh, to our partners again, uh, NASA and SpaceX, uh, for making this happen for us. All right. Thank you, Frank. So now we're going to jump over to question and answer. I'm going to start here in the room, and then we'll go on to the phone bridge. If you are dialed into the phone bridge, please press star 1. If you have a question, that'll put you in our queue. And then you can press star 2 to get out if your question's been answered. So, and reminder, we have briefers remote, so if you can address your question to somebody, that will just help us keep everything sorted. Um, so I'll start here in the room, Mark. Oh, thank you, uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week and Space Technology. I believe this is for Dana. Uh, Dana, um, have you been able to, to chase down the, the moisture issue in the spacewalk helmet from the last spacewalk? And if so, um, is there a remedy or was there an explanation where you can just proceed further? Um, I'm sort of asking that in the context of continuing work with the uh, solar array upgrade. And so maybe you could address where that stands and where you hope to go with Crew 4 on that. Thank you. Sure. Um, we, we are still looking into it. Um, you know, as, as we've noted at the end of the EVA, there was some moisture. It's a thin layer of, of liquid that was um, on the surface of the bubble of Mateus's um, helmet. Uh, it's more than what we would normally see. You know, the suit can uh, spit water is, is kind of the phenomenon. It's got a cooling system, and just like you would experience kind of on the ground, you can have condensation, and so you can have liquid that might kind of spit out. I think we've seen that on about 12 EVAs overall, but but the, the general experience is that's a very that's a very small amount. This was a bit more than normal, so we want to take that very seriously. It was um, quite a bit less than what we had experienced on EVA 23 when we had the major anomaly, but but still water, liquid water, you know, in the suit is is a concern. And so we've got an investigation team taking a look at it. Um, it gets really complex in terms of you know, you've got to do troubleshooting on orbit and we can't immediately bring things home and, and look at samples. So it usually takes us a little bit of getting hardware back and forth to really 
do a proper investigation. Um, so we don't yet know the cause, but it's our intention to go, go look at the cause and, and go address that. Um, we actually did bring some water samples home on the Soyuz flight, so we brought some home with Mark. So we'll take a look at that. We don't see any indications of any kind of a water quality issue, but that'll be something that we'll be interested to look at. Um, we did some troubleshooting on board, and, and the suit looks fine. We can't uh, recreate the issue, which could be a sign that um, this is related to kind of the cooling system, the amount of moisture we had in it, and the condensation, but it's really too early to say that. Um, <clears throat> the other suits look fine. There's no issue with them. They, they don't have any indications of a problem, but we'll be conservative and, and be keeping an eye on that. If we got into a case where we had to do a contingency EVA, certainly we'd go look at the mitigations and what we know in the investigation, and uh, we would not use that particular suit as we're trying to understand uh, what happened to it. So we're pretty early in that, but we are taking a really close look to see if we can better understand why we had that much water in that suit. News. This was for Steve. You talked about we've got AX-1 launching next week, Crew-4, and clearly the demand for private space missions to the space station is growing up. How tough and challenging is it to manage that schedule? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. As Kathy said, we're really, and, and the benefit for the commercial crew program is with, with SpaceX, we have tremendous fleet inside. I would say they're a tremendous partner. So we get to look at the Dragon spacecraft for both the um, Axiom launch and ours. And so what we're doing is just taking it sort of, I would say, one step at a time. So uh, that Axiom spacecraft has been fueled and it, it's headed up to 39A today to go mate with the vehicle. And so we just take it day by day and then uh, watch our vehicle day by day as well. And so uh, I think we understand the key decision points for anything like this where you're managing two complicated missions. It's really what are the decision points you need to make and when. And, and um, so far, our team's been able to, to manage it in concert with SpaceX. And if we get into a scenario where we're not comfortable, we'll do what we did. You know, we moved the launch for Crew-4 already a day, and we just need a little bit more time and spacing between those flights, and so we'll continue to do that. So. All right, thanks, Steve. One more in the room. Hi, this is Andrea Leinfelder of the Houston Chronicle. Um, this question's for Jessica and then Steve. Um, can you confirm that the Freedom Crew Dragon currently being built which is the fourth one, is the last one SpaceX will build, and then you will instead focus on Starship? And is four enough for the commercial crew program moving forward? Thank you. Hey, this is Jessica. I can start with that one. So yes, this is, right, so this is the fourth um, Dragon 2 vehicle, Dragon 2 crewed vehicle that we are adding to the fleet. While it is the last, you know, full vehicle that is coming out of our factory as a whole, we are, you know, our production line is basically still going to be partly open. I think some people think it just all shuts down and it's done. But in reality, we have a very active refurbishment and spares program. We also have to continue to build new trunks and a lot of new hardware for every mission. So even though this is kind of the last, you know, hopefully the last full vehicle we have to build all as one, we are constantly going to have basically all the parts available. So if you think of a Dragon vehicle made up of all of its different parts, we're going to have ability to swap out those parts to keep the life going for a very long time. And then overall, we are working to um, fully certify the vehicle with NASA for five flights. And so if you have the fleet of um, four vehicles, over five flights, you get up to 20 missions. And then additionally, we're gonna even go beyond that and we can keep certifying hardware up to more and more flights. So we're gonna make sure that the Dragon vehicle is ready, available, and certified to support all the missions that NASA will need to the space station for both crew and cargo. And I will say these are the four vehicles is for crew. We have the cargo variant as well that is act that has several vehicles in the fleet. Yeah, I would say from a NASA perspective and CCP, we've been working hand in hand with SpaceX to look at the, the sparing strategy, right? And I came from the space shuttle world and at some points we probably didn't have enough spares and we've been talking to SpaceX about that. So we've got a sparing strategy as Jessica talked about. Um, as she said, they have not shut down production lines so they can still make thrusters, they can still make the heat shield laminate, they can still make all the components they need. And so when we looked at it so far with the four vehicles, it, it looks pretty good of getting out through the end of, of space station. Uh, but again, as Jessica said, 
we've got a good spare strategy in place. They're building up spares for things like tanks and pod panels and heat shields, and, and that'll help us carry us out. And then, as Jessica said, we'll continue to embark upon this five flight uh, certification for reuse for Dragon. And when we do that, you know, I, I think that puts us in a good spot to go out to the end of, of uh, space stations. So. All right, thank you, Steve. We're gonna jump over to the phone bridge now. Again, if you have a question, hit star one to get into the queue. If your question's been answered, you can press star two to get out. Let's start off at the top with Jeff Faust and Space News. Jeff? Hey, good morning. Uh, question for any of the NASA personnel who wanna answer this. Uh, curious about the status of the uh, deep barter agreement with Roscosmos, uh, whether that will be complete in time to affect a uh, crew swap for the Crew-5 and fall Soyuz missions, and at what point do you need uh, a decision in place regarding crew assignments uh, for those upcoming missions? Thanks. So um, the uh, agreement is still over with our Roscosmos uh, government agencies. Um, the team continues to work together to kind of protect for it, and I'll have Dana jump in when I'm done. But um, you know, we had a uh, uh, cosmonaut here getting sized for suits. We're looking at, you know, different options for our crew members um, potentially being backup crew members on a Soyuz. So we're kind of starting to lay in kind of the prudent, you know, long-term measures to be able to enable. At some point, and Dana can tell you, at some point, if we don't get the paperwork, out of the Russian government and over to our side of the government, you know, we'll have to, um, we won't have enough time to be able to support crew training and operations for a crew five. But I'll tell you, we still feel like that's our long-term logistics strategy. And so we'll continue to look at having it in place then for the next crewed mission. But Dana, you jump in with the timeline. Yeah, I, I'll just add to what Kathy said. It's really important uh, for us programmatically. It gives us a lot more robust capability to fly crew on each other's vehicles. Um, we're very much aligned with uh, Roscosmos in that goal. Both of us have our own processes we have to work through. You know, they have their own version of a foreign ministry they've got to work through, et cetera. So they're going through that process. Um, you know, some of the critical timelines are really suit builds. That kind of becomes kind of the first thing that, that we hit, that uh, you've got to build, you know, a suit if you're flying on Soyuz or a suit over here. And as Kathy mentioned, we've already started that work over here on, on our side uh, for the cosmonaut, uh, you know, candidate crew. Um, we haven't started that work yet on, on the Russian side. They need to finish some of their work first, so that's one of the critical milestones for us. I don't have specific schedules. You know, everyone continues to look and kind of refine how far out you could push that. And then training is the next consideration. We have to keep the training going. And so the teams are working together to keep all of those things progressing. Uh, but there's a, a, a point in time where you kind of hit, hit a limit and you either got to have the plan in place or we, or we have to push it out a little. So we're not there yet. We're still both working jointly on it and we're hopeful we can uh, stay on those timelines. All right, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Kathy. Next up, Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Stephen? Thank you uh, for my uh, taking my question. Uh, just to follow up on that last question, are there any uh, cosmonauts currently in the U.S. training uh, for Dragon or ISS missions, and also vice versa, any uh, U.S. astronauts currently in Russia for training? And uh, also, I was hoping maybe Steve Stitch uh, or uh, Kathy could talk about the target uh, nominal landing dates for the AX-1 and Crew-3 missions, assuming uh, the launches remain on schedule and assuming good weather and all that. Okay, Dana, you wanna take the first one? Yeah, I'll take the first one. Um, let's see, in terms of overall training plans, following up with what we were just talking about, um, we've got some flexibility in terms of what we can do. We have had folks over here in, in country uh, participating in in training, we don't currently have anyone um, over here. Both teams have plans laid in, including uh, when our crew would need to go over for training. Right now, we don't happen to have any ongoing, but uh, we have both been working towards our nominal integrated uh, training plans between our crew traveling to Russia and uh, cosmonauts traveling over here. And I, and I can 
take the approximate undock and landing dates uh, for Axiom, uh, you know, we'll launch on 4.6, and uh, it is a flight day three rendezvous, so docking very early in the morning on 4.8, uh, you know, eight, eight days, eight dock days that Dana talked about means an undock around uh, the 16th or so and landing on the 16th or 17th, which gives us plenty of spacing uh, to get to the 420 crew four launch and then, you know, Crew four right now, that um, would be about a 24 hour rendezvous for the 20th launch. Um, and so I would anticipate an undock about five days later, so around uh, uh, the 25th or 26th in the landing. I don't have the specific landing times because we've just adjusted the date, but s somewhere around there, uh, you know, 24 hours after that. So that would be the plan right now. All right, moving on, we have Joey Roulette. I think you're freelance right now, Joey. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, this one's for either Dana or Cassie. Um, did any of the NASA officials in Kazakhstan for Vanda Hayes' return yesterday um, have any discussions with Russian partners on the commitment on their commitment to the International Space Station? Um, and if so, how did those talks go? And, and then if not, um, I was wondering if you could just give a sense of, of where things stand on your discussions with the Russian partners, particularly on um, their space station commitments um, as Rogozin, you know, tries to get those U.S. sanctions removed on those Russian companies. Thanks. Going down our path for station extension across the board. Um, you know, we're really right now headed towards a multilateral control board in the June time frame. Um, one of the first steps in that is at the program level, Joel and Dana will be, be conducting their space station control board with their, their international space station partners getting ready and talking about each of the individual partner station extension plans, which are all continuing to make progress. And then at the headquarters level, we'll be, we'll be planning to have, following that, a multilateral control board for that. All of our international partners, including Roscosmos, are making progress on moving towards station extension um, through 2030. It, it's, but we all have to go through the process, just like we talked about the careful process for us to get ready for human space flight. There's a careful budget process <laughs> and, a, and go, final government approval process that all of us have to go through to get through these next steps. But um, we all understand the importance of this continued partnership, even in really, really, really tough times, and that this is important for us to continue to work together and maintain, for some of us, which have been decades in low Earth orbit, um, and continue to create the safe, pla safe place for us to do research and technology development together in space. And Dana, jump in with anything you'd like to add. Oh, I think that's great. Um, you know, at the program level, um, we continue discussions and continue working towards uh, 2030. Um, they, they touched on the subject of when uh, Joel Montabano was in, in Russia and, you know, no, no changes at all to the, the plans. As Kathy mentioned, you know, each one of our partners has a process they go through. Some of them it can take up to a year. You know, it's not unlike the budgetary cycles that we go through where you have to get appropriated and there's a lot of discussions that take place through each government agency. And so each one of the partnerships is working their way through that. Um, we get periodic updates, and as Kathy said, um, probably our next big large update for us is either end of April or early May at the program level, and then we'll do that at uh, Kathy and the headquarters level across all the agencies to uh, get a better understanding of where everyone is in their process for the 2030 extension. All right. Next question is going to come from David Curley, Discovery Channel. David? Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I guess it's for Steve or Jessica. Can you talk a little bit uh, detailed about the heat shield components um, reused from which spacecraft, how many times? Uh, have you got a sense of the average of how many times you might be able to use these components? Thank you. Uh, let's see, I can start, and I, um, sp I don't remember the specific spacecraft that we were using. The, and, and what we're talking about really is not necessarily the 
um, the TPS material for, uh, for this particular flight, where we're talking about uh, the structure essentially that, that, that the thermal protection system uh, mounts to or, or is attached to that's being reused. I want to say it was one of the CRS flights. Uh, right now, NASA has only approved a one-time reuse uh, of, that, of that heat shield. We went through a, a very specific analysis for this flight uh, to get to that um, reuse, and we're going to work with SpaceX to try to figure out, you know, can we go more than one reuse? And, and I'll turn it over to Jessica, and, um, and she may have more details on which flight it came from. Yeah, yeah, actually, I don't have anything. Oops, I don't have anything to add from that. Thanks, Steve. All right. Moving on, next question comes from Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Marsha? Steve, please. Um, Jessica Watkins is going to be making um, her own history, becoming the first black woman to actually live in live aboard the space station. I'd like you to comment on, on that if you could. And I'm also checking to see if Jeanette Epps is still assigned to the first operational Starliner flight. And given that's still out there in the distance, um, how come her she hasn't had a mission sooner um, or at least moved up to um, one of the SpaceX flights? Thanks. Yeah. You want me to speak to Jessica? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can start. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think Frank actually said it well. Um, you know, he, he relayed the uh, European ESA's experience with uh, the benefits of having Samantha fly and how just her, her flying and being a role model for ESA was able to kind of garner interest and, and uh, kind of help, you know, outreach and, and, and probably broaden a lot of a lot of thoughts folks had about what's achievable for them to do. And so I look at this very similarly. You know, we really ought to have very diverse crews. You know, the more diverse we are, the more relatable, you know, spaceflight is to everyone. And, and the reality is anyone could go and, and do that if they, they, you know, chose to make that their dream. So I think it's fantastic. And, uh, and I think, you know, Frank's sentiments about Samantha very much hold true for Jessica, and I hope it inspires a whole new generation of space travelers. I want to talk to yeah, yeah, crew I, I assignments? Can, I can talk to crew assignments a little bit. Uh, Jeanette is still uh, assigned to Starliner 1, the first PCM flight. Um, I think we'll be looking at the, the crew assignments with uh, the, the flight ops director here a little bit for, for those flights coming up and, and um, maybe adjusting those in the summer time frame. And I got to meet with the crew the other day, um, Chell and Jessica, and the whole crew, and, and you could just see the excitement in Jessica, and she's very excited to go fly. I think that, you know, what I hope that will inspire a lot of other uh, young African-American ladies to maybe pursue math and science and, and, and the astronaut corps at some point. So, I mean, I look forward to seeing her on orbit. It's always great when you watch these crew members go through their initial training as an astronaut and you see them then get assigned to a flight and you can just see their excitement. And when we talked to Jessica the other day, she was extremely excited about the flight, and you could tell she's ready to go, and that's, that's what uh, Chell and the whole crew told me. They, they said, hey, we know you've got a very complicated spring, and we're going to be ready to go when you're ready, and so that was really exciting for me to see. Okay. Next up, we have Robert Perlman, Collect Space. Robert? Thanks. Um, for Jessica, um, Given that this is now the fourth Crew Dragon, is there anything different in design, even minor, between, let's say, the first Dragon, Endeavor, and, and now Freedom? Um, and would there be any way of determining what Dragon you were in if you were inside? Is there any visual cue as to which one you're, you're positioned in? Hey, good question. So... SpaceX, basically, our, our philosophy is as we fly vehicles, we continually learn from them. So any, even if it's a minor issue, anything we see, um, so for example, I think some of you have heard, you know, we had some issues with the waste system. Um, we learned about that on the Inspiration4 mission, and then we made some design changes to that. Now, that wouldn't actually be visible to the crew, but these are design changes that we implement to improve safety of the vehicle and safety for the astronauts. And we coordinate all those changes with NASA ahead of time, make sure they're on board, that they can certify them, and then we go ahead and make those changes. But there's actually been, you know, noticeable to the astronauts, not that many changes. Um, we had some changes on the trunk fins and the waste system. 
Um, so it's been, you know, some things, but I'd say overall pretty minor. I don't think you'd walk in and say, whoa, that's a totally different vehicle um, from the first one to this one. And I can add just a couple of things, Jessica, if I, if I can. Um, I, I would say if you're in the cru this vehicle compared to the others, probably the one minor thing you might notice is there's a USB port to actually uh, recharge their laptops, and that's one little minor thing. Uh, the cargo pallet's a little different in this uh, Crew 4 vehicle, and I think uh, the plan is to retrofit the other vehicles. And overall, when you just look at from uh, the Demo 2 vehicle to this one, Probably the one most significant change is there's, there's essentially a common structure between the cargo vehicles and the crew vehicles now. And, and, and they start out as a common structure and then they get modified a little bit. But for the most part, these vehicles are all the same. And, and SpaceX does a great job. If there's, uh, as they watch the systems perform in flight, of making modifications to make them safer and safer for future flight. So there's little minor changes. But overall, if you're a crew member, you, if you stuck your head in there, you might not even notice the difference. So. All right, moving along, our next question comes from Chelsea Gould at space.com. Chelsea? Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so it was mentioned previously that with four Dragons, uh, you know, now that will be flying up to five flights each to the space station, um, it should basically get us to the end of the space station's lifespan. Um, is there currently a plan in place for Crew Dragon usage after the, after the station's lifespan comes to a close. Hey, this is Jessica, I can answer that one. So, right, as of now, we're planning to make sure our number one priority is make sure that we keep providing the crew and cargo services that the space station needs. That's our main priority. Then um, for what I would call maybe free flyer commercial passenger missions that don't go to the space station, we will basically evaluate over the next few years, should that be a Dragon mission or would that be a Starship mission? It's just going to depend on the readiness of the Starship vehicle, um, mission profiles, things like that, as to whether we would select a Dragon or a Starship for future human space flight missions that are not going to the space station. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Our next question comes from Marsha Smith, spacepolicyonline.com. Uh, thanks so much. My question has to do with schedules and cadence. And uh, I'm curious, what is the projected launch date for Crew 5? And exactly when is it that you have that drop dead date that you have to decide who the crew members are going to be and if Anna Kakina is going to be one of them? And then if OST 2 goes as goes well in May, what have you got penciled in for the crew flight test and for Starliner 1? And then once you have Starliner flying, it, it, are you like alternating crew dragons and Starliners one each a year, or what is the cadence once they're both operational? Yeah, I, I, I can start, uh, and then maybe Dana can jump, jump in. So um, uh, first of all, let, let's we'll talk a little bit about the Boeing flights. Um, the plan right now is to launch uh, of T2 in, in May, right after the beta cutout, uh, around May 20th. Uh, that flight is on track. Uh, in fact, uh, the final, the booster is shipping today to head down to KSC. That we'll start stacking that booster uh, on the 19th and prep for that flight. Um, the service module and crew module are mated. Uh, they tomorrow we start a big test of the integrated test on the on the crew module and the service module, uh, a big integrated test. Uh, a lot of the valve work is starting to wrap up, uh, and we're in, on good track for that. And then, and then relative, so that flight would fly in, in May, and then the plan right now is to fly the, the crewed flight test uh, by the end of the year toward the late end of this calendar year. And as Kathy said, we'll basically step back and, and look at the performance of OFT2, and then evaluate when to go fly CFT. And then overall, the long-term strategy is to alternate between SpaceX and Boeing once Boeing completes the crewed flight test and certification, then we'll alternate you know, one, one flight uh, a year with, uh, for the space station missions uh, for, for Boeing and SpaceX. So that's the long-term strategy. Um, you know, right now, we're still working with Dana on the exact timing of, uh, of the Crew-5 mission. It'll be in the, likely the September timeframe. And uh, relative to the backup crew plan, we've got a, a plan for backup crew. We're working with, uh, with Dana and Rose Cosmos to try to understand uh, when we get this agreement in place. And then I think we've got, you know, a little more time before we'd have to pull the trigger on a backup crew member. 
Okay. Thanks, Steve. Our next question is going to come from Stuart Wolpert with UCLA News Report. Stuart. Thank you very much. Um, I think you said that you expect benefits of the Crew 4 mission to include health technology and plant science. Can you say a bit more about this? What do you hope to learn about health technology and plant science? Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, we can get you specifics on any of the experiments that you want. So let me just talk about some of our, our general goals that we hope to advance. I mean, I think, you know, everyone probably appreciates and understands, um, or, or maybe you don't. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, uh, if you want to do really, really long duration spaceflight, like out to, to Mars and beyond, um, we all know we need vitamins, we need minerals. Um, some of those aren't that stable and don't stay for a long period of time. For example, vitamin C breaks down. And so one of the ways you can, you can deal with that is through having live crops, live plants and growth. And so we're very interested in that. I'll tell you, our crew members, even for six month flights, also really, really appreciate just kind of having fresh food. Um, I once asked a crew member when they came home what they missed most, and they told me lettuce. And it, and it was the crunch. And, and um, you know, so, so for us, uh, the ability to grow plants and to really understand um, how we would do that uh, is really important. How do we incorporate it into spacecraft? You know, do we really have growing chambers? Do we have plants all over the place? Does it look like a farm? So we have a lot of work that we're really interested in progressing um, in that arena. You know, in, in the health area, there's a range of things we're always trying to understand. There's some, a lot of aspects with human health. You hear us talk about that a lot. We know that the body changes, um, the body changes in microgravity, and then in some cases, some aspects continue to change with longer duration spaceflight. And so um, we're always looking for um, a couple different aspects. One is diagnostics. What can we do better to understand the situation? on board and the health of our, our crew members. That also helps us understand kind of the efficacy of, of uh, preventative measures that we're using. Um, we have learned a lot, you know, through the years. We've, we've really done a lot to really um, deal with the risks of, of bone loss, muscle change, that type of thing. And so we continue to, to look in areas both with um, research for our crew, but then also other technologies that can either help us mitigate things or help us diagnostically. And we can get you a rundown of all the specific details if you're interested in that. Thanks, Dana and Stuart. Yeah, I can follow up with you and give you just a rundown of specific projects that Crew 4 are expected to work on. Okay, I've got one more on the phone bridge. Uh, Stephen Clark, Spaceflight Now, one more time. Stephen? Can you hear me, Stephen? Yes, yes, can you hear me now? Yep, gotcha, go for it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for taking a second question from me. I think this one's for uh, Frank Devin. Um, regarding the European robotic arm, uh, just wanted to get an update on your plans for activating that arm. I know at one point, um, Matthias Marr or uh, Samantha Christopheretti were planning to do a spacewalk in the Orlan suits. Is that still, uh, plan for a joint spacewalk with the Russian cosmonauts. Um, can you just talk about generally the status of, uh, of activating that? Has is, is that been put on hold or is it still going forward? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for uh, the question. So uh, we are moving forward with the commissioning and the initial on orbit uh, validation of the European robotic arm. Uh, there were some technical issues discovered uh, I would say in uh, the September, December timeframe last year uh, that were related to uh, bus communication issues uh, between the, the central computer and the service module and uh, the European robotic arm computer. Uh, these issues have been solved right now. So we have a solid plan together with our uh, Russian colleagues to do the uh, on orbit validation of the, the era. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to those delays, uh, the, the spacewalk that was planned for Matthias uh, cannot longer take place. Uh, as uh, we were just discussing, uh, Crew 3 is planned to come back uh, by the end of, uh, of April. And the first spacewalks, the first two, uh, are planned, uh, I think, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and then the, the spacewalk that was planned for Matthias is only planned in May, uh, June timeframe uh, right now. Uh, because of the delays, uh, technical delays that we had. 
uh, we are still uh, looking uh, into uh, the possibility for Samantha uh, to do an EVA uh, together with uh, with our Russian colleagues from uh, Roscosmos. Also there, the plans have changed. Uh, there is not uh, a definite answer at this moment, uh, but we are pursuing the options for uh, Samantha still to do uh, an EVA uh, related to the European robotic arm. And we still hope to finalize the whole uh, in-orbit validation of ERA uh, by September, October uh, this year, which is of course uh, quite some delay uh, before what, what we expected. It was expected by June uh, this year, uh, but okay, technical issues uh, happen. Uh, space is not easy, we all know that. Uh, we discover things uh, on orbit. The, the main thing is that we can fix them and that we can move forward. Okay, thank you, Frank. I've got one final one on the phone bridge, and then I've got two follow-ups here in the room, and then we'll wrap. So last one on the phone bridge, Marcia Smith, Space Policy Online. Marcia. Um, thanks so much for giving me a second question. I was wondering if Kathy or Dana could tell us how Mark is feeling after his year in space, and are there – I know that his year in space wasn't exactly planned from the beginning, but do you have plans for future year in space? missions and what have you learned from uh, from the uh, year in space that you had with Scott Kelly and uh, Courtney Inkel? Hey, Dana, I'll let you take it. Okay. Um, let's see. We haven't been able to talk directly to Mark yet, though uh, our team members have. Clearly, they flew back with him and they just landed this morning. But, but all accounts are he's doing great. If you uh, saw the landing video, um, you know, he, he looked fantastic. So, um, no issues at all. Everything very normal and what we'd expect. You know, when crew members first come home, there's a lot of dizziness. It is hard to adjust that that happens, even if you have a shorter duration flight. Um, so he's he's doing great. In terms of long duration flight, you know, there's a lot we learned. I talked a minute ago about uh, changes that the body undergoes. Um, and we don't yet really know enough to really understand. So we understand a lot about six months space flight. We understand a lot about changes in the bone and changes in the muscle, changes in the eye. What we really don't um, know yet or what are all those things that we would learn if everyone, if we had that whole same data set that was flying to one year. Um, we think we've done a great job with, with exercise and conditioning to mitigate a lot of the bone and muscle loss, for example, having more data points you know, out to a year will certainly help us really understand the efficacy of, of what we've done so far and also um, how certain things progress like eye degradation. Um, so I couldn't rattle off for you every single thing we've learned with um, Mark. We certainly could get that to you. I'll just tell you that it, it's in the, the vein of really trying to expand our understanding about what does that additional time on orbit do and projecting what might it do even longer. Of course, Mars missions are even longer than that. So we're absolutely um, interested in doing more long duration missions. Um, for us, obviously the flight campaign and having uh, steady flights between our two providers is key for us really looking at um, how and when we'd fly uh, different crew members, the, the swapping back and forth with Soyuz and, and our vehicles, all of that's a factor in terms of how and when you would go and use strategies like that, but um, it does, continue to be an important um, focal point for us to really understand what even longer duration space flight does. All right, thanks, Dana. We've got time for quick follow-ups in the room. I think, Andrew, you had your hand up. Uh, thanks for the extra question. Um, we hadn't talked about parachutes in a while. I know um, the last few missions, they one parachute lagged, and it was within normal parameters, but you guys were still looking into it. Can you give us an update on that? Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I can take that question. So. Um, so yeah, we've had the, the last two flights, uh, the Crew 2 return and the CRS-24 return, we had one of the four main chutes that was uh, lagged a little bit behind in its full inflation. Uh, so what we have done, um, and, and we, we took an in-flight anomaly on Crew 2, and once we saw the, what happened on CRS-24, I held that sign off of that anomaly, closing out for Crew 2. What we did uh, after uh, the CRS-24 flight is we went and looked at all the hardware, all four of the main chutes. Was there anything that we saw that was anomalous? And we didn't find anything on that. We didn't find anything on Crew-2 when we looked at all that hardware. We went back in partnership side by side with SpaceX and we looked at all the 
data from the entry, all the GNC parameters. Was there anything anomalous with the, with the GNC that might have had some certain rate to, to cause a, a slow inflation? We couldn't find anything there. So we went back and then looked at some of our testing that we have done, um, uh, both in the, the first shoot, was what's called a Mark II and Mark III. And what we really have seen is, for this particular kind of shoot, it does have this propensity at times um, as three shoots get out and inflate and sort of catch air, one of them gets a little star for air and it will be a little slow to, to inflate. Uh, in all the data that we've seen so far, we, we know that shoot will finally inflate and we know it won't be more than one shoot. So that's our resolution for going ahead and flying uh, Crew 4 launching and also uh, returning in the Crew 3 vehicle. So. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, Mark? Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Corot uh, for Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, regarding uh, Mark Van de Heij, is he clear to live at home now, or does he uh, take some observation here for a period, and if so, how long? Yeah, all, all our crew members, when they um, return, um, uh, we have teams, we have a, a physician, and we have physiological experts that work with the crew to kind of do what we would call post-flight conditioning. I, I don't know off the top of my head what the duration of that is, but um, you know we have on-site capabilities in a, in a, in a gym there, and, it, and we have a pool, and so there's a lot of conditioning uh, that the crew undergoes. They, they do, you know, dizziness and, and kind of getting your balance back is one of the key things that, that takes, you know, a few days to a week to kind of get back, and so they work on that as well as just general kind of um, conditioning so we can get you if you're interested in, in the very specific you know durations we could get that but there is there is definitely post-flight um, work their family's actually already with them their family came out to Ellington and so they join their family immediately and so they're they're back with their family immediately um, as they're going through their post-flight you know conditioning and, and getting back to acclimating to the uh, the 1g environment all right thanks Dana and Gina did you have one more I've got about a minute Um, I think a lot of things have worked. Um, they're certainly better on orbit at, at growing green things than I am on the ground, so my hat's off to them. Um, you know, some of the things, there, you know, we've got a couple different facilities that, are, that we're capable of using for, for some of the research. Um, one is very, very controlled, and we can control levels of gases and a lot of other things there, and so they're really trying to explore not just uh, the ability to grow things, but but what's what's different? Water delivery systems are a challenge. You know, we, you all know what it looks like here at water plants, and you can imagine there you've got to come up with these kind of complex systems that you can embed the roots in. You don't just have soil, and so some of the things we're really trying to learn are um, about the facility and the capabilities surrounding the plants that best either mimic or support their growth. Um, so we have learned a lot about like the water delivery systems as an example. Um, you all know too that your plants lean towards the sun. You all probably know too that peppers, for example, will hang down. Um, there's different phenomena in microgravity, you know, that the, the peppers don't, don't do that. So in, in terms of a practical sense, we've made a lot of headway in terms of being able to grow them. I think our researchers could tell you a lot of really other interesting things that they've really found that are probably differences between uh, 1G and, and 0G. I don't know those off the top of my head, but there are a lot of you know, observations that, that we put back into the facilities to, to really try to optimize how we grow things. And you know, the cool thing for the crew is in addition to returning samples for the uh, researchers, we um, let them eat some of it. So they got to eat some like hatched chili peppers recently. So I, I know the crew is always excited to help participate in those. All right, thank you, Dana. That's gonna wrap it up for us today. Reminder, in just 30 minutes from now, we're gonna hear from the Crew 4 astronauts themselves. So stick around to hear more about their mission coming up to the International Space Station. Thanks one more time to all of my briefers today, everybody for tuning in to ask questions. Stick around for the crew, but that'll do it for us from now, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>